everybody and thanks for joining us again for our online Sunday service. I'm Pastor Ada Hooker and this is Pastor Sam and we just want to thank you for worshiping with us. We're so excited that we get to worship together. This is a very special Sunday for two reasons. Number one, it's the first Sunday of the month, which means it's our communion Sunday. And number two is we have a very special guest speaker who's going to bring the word to us. Pastor, Apostle, Bishop, Dr. John Bevere is going to be speaking to us, so we're so excited about that. Yeah, this is a good word. Uh, John asked us, can I send a word straight to your church that God has given me for right now during this time in history? And man, is it powerful. Uh, I just encourage you, lean in this morning, stick with it. Right. The last part of this word, he's going to say a prayer over you that is life-changing. It will shift you on the inside. So That's I right. just want to encourage you, get comfortable, and let's worship God together. Hey, C3 Victory family, we're so glad that we're able to connect with you online right now in this time. And so... We're just ready to jump into some worship with all of you. So wherever you're at, laying in bed, sitting on your couch, standing in your living room, wherever it may be, we just invite the presence of God to flow in that place right now. So why don't you get ready, get your hearts ready, and let's enter into some worship together.
Hey church family, let's get ready to receive communion together. So go ahead and call your family in and I want to read to you a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The part I want to bring out to us real quickly is where he says, you proclaim. One of the great advantages that we have right now is when we receive communion together as a family, we have a moment to examine maybe some things that have been going on inside of us, some things that have been going on inside of our family, and we can proclaim something different. When we receive the body and the blood of Jesus, it's not just like receiving juice or bread or whatever you have in there. What we're doing is we're proclaiming that we're no longer under the law of sin and death, but we're proclaiming we're under the new covenant, we're under the power, we're under the authority of Jesus. And so maybe there's been a few things that now we need to use communion to proclaim something different in our home. Maybe we've seen a trend. Maybe there's been a tone or a voice that we no longer want in our home. Let's use communion to begin to proclaim something different. I want to bring in my family now, and I want to show us a little bit of how this looks like for us. So family, come on in. Come on in. Yep. And uh, stand here. We're going to receive communion together. This is kind of the way it's looking for us and our family. So whatever you have in your home is okay for the elements of communion. You know, and when Jesus broke bread with his disciples, that's what they had. So we have a, a slice of bread here. We're going to break it in pieces. Daddy, you want to hand that around? We're going to give everybody a little piece of that just in remembrance of the body of Christ. And then the element to represent the blood, whatever you have, juice, water even, we have some sweet tea. Come on. We're gonna use some sweet tea as our element for the blood of Jesus. And you know, as the scripture says, these elements are just to be used as a representation of what Jesus did. So I would encourage you, uh, gather those, or hand those out to your family members, and then just pray over those, and you guys receive communion together. Let's pray, guys. Hey, Victory family, I am so excited to talk to you a little bit about giving, and um, I just want to say something real quickly as your pastor. I've been so encouraged by your giving, by your continued faithfulness as we've been physically apart. I feel like everybody is realizing it doesn't mean we're spiritually apart, and we're still moving forward, and we're still being able to take care of each other. And, you know, when you have a spiritual family, which is what we are, there's some elements that happen in a spiritual family in times like this. Uh, we love each other, we check in on each other, we uh, stay connected. And another way is that we uh, resource each other. We're there for each other financially when the family needs it. And that's kind of what's happening in this time that we're in. If you go to our website, you're gonna see not only our usual three ways to give, but you're gonna also see a tab for those that are in need financially. And this is specifically for our church family so that we can stand together in this time of hardship, in this time of testing, and so that we can care for each other. It is such a blessing to get to pastor a church that loves to take care of each other and loves to stay there and stand with each other for our community. It reminds me of the scripture that I want to read you in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's a little bit lengthy, but just stay with me. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 says this, I really don't need to write to you about the ministry of giving, 
for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you, that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you are really ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want, to be, I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who are in need, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Church family, I want you to know that we're in a time where we need to stand together. And so what I'm asking you to do is when you give of your tithes, thank you for staying faithful with that. But would you pray about an additional gift to our missions fund, whether you go to our website and give that way, whether you do text to give, or whether you write a check and mail it in to 1604 East Crestwood Drive, Victoria, Texas, 77901. However you do it, would you pray about, I know that Ada and I, we're going to give extra in, uh, above and beyond our tithes to the missions fund because guess what, church? We are not in a time to shrink back. We're actually in a time to sow. And giving is such an incredible opportunity because God, I believe that God has the expectation of us to care for those that are a part of our spiritual family. And guess what? We've already been doing it. Because of your past giving, we've already been able to step up and be there for our church family in this time of need where people are being laid off, where they're having to care for loved ones, where there was unexpected uh, a lack of income or expenses. The family is stepping up and taking care of each other. So would you pray and would you ask God, this is what I want you to ask him, God, what extra do I have that I can sow into this? And whatever he speaks to your heart, that's what you do. I don't want you given in response to pressure from me or, or some sort of legalism or anything like that. I want you giving because you're excited to sow into the church family. Because we know that when we sow, that there's going to be a reaping. Not only a reaping in our life, but a reaping in our church family. This is a time where we stand together. And I just want to thank you, church, because you're doing such a good job. Uh, pastor Aid and I, we love being your pastors. We love leading this church because I know you are so generous. So let me say this. Thank you in advance for your generosity because it is such a blessing to be able to stand with our church family in this time of need. God bless you and let's pray together and let's just ask God to speak to us what we need to give. Father, we just thank you for this time right now. 
Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would put on a heart. God, I know that you've already put a number on my heart of what I want to sow into the missions fund. And God, I just thank you that as we do this, Lord, that this family is standing together. And God, I just believe and I speak that as we sow in faith, that you're going to provide not just for our needs, but an over and abundance, God. God, above and beyond what we've needed. God, so that in every circumstance, we can be a blessing. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we put our full trust and hope in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, church family. Hey, family, now that we've worshiped the Lord together and we've received communion, let's get ready to hear John Bevere speak to our church. How about we pray and just ask God to prepare our hearts for the word? Father, I just thank you so much for this word that I believe is coming straight from you. Jesus, thank you that uh, our hearts are receptive. God, I thank you that every person that's going to hear this word, God, is, they're going to hear something that you're speaking to them. God, that their faith is going to arise, that it's going to go to a new level. God, I thank you that power is entering into them, entering into their family, into their home. And God, I thank you for miracles that are going to break loose as a result of us believing your word. We thank you in advance, and we thank you now for all these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey everyone, it's C3. It's so great to be with you, even if it's by video in this time that we're in. But let me say this, you have the most amazing pastors, Pastor Sam and Ada. Now a lot of you don't realize this, but Ada is actually sister to my daughter-in-law. So let's make this really, really clear. Ada is the oldest sister, Juliana is the youngest sister, and Juliana is married to our oldest son, Addison, and have given us four G babies. But anyway, your pastors and I decided that it would be wise if I spoke to you more as a church father. Yeah, I'm turning 61 in June, and don't say it. I don't look a day over 80, I know. But anyway, um, it's hard to believe that Lisa and I have been walking with the Lord now 40 years. For me, it's been a little over, for her a little under. We have been in full-time ministry now for almost 35 years, and we've learned and seen so much that we felt we could come alongside of your pastors and help strengthen you in this time. And I want to tell you this right now. This time that we're in is very serious. However, it is not a catastrophe. And there is an advantage to what I'm saying, and I'm going to share with you about that in just a minute. But here's the situation. Something that we had back in the 80s and early 90s is we had very strong faith. And it actually was almost forced upon us by not having the amazing fathers, church fathers that we have today in the church. And when I say fathers, I'm talking about leaders now. We have pastors in their 30s and 40s that quite honestly, I am admiring for the way that they are leading their churches. And your pastors certainly are included in that number. And they might be in their 50s. But I'm, I'm saying we have pastors who really Really, really deeply care for the sheep. We were a little dysfunctional back in those days. But what it did is it caused us to develop our faith. And let me say this. The Bible says it's impossible. Listen to these words, Hebrews 11, 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is so important. It's the very foundation of our relationship with God. And so if you look at Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus makes the most amazing statement. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And right now, my greatest concern in seeing the church in America from more of a 36,000 view, because I'm traveling constantly and so is Lisa, is I feel like the faith level in the church is not very deep right now. And let me say this, it's nothing to be discouraged about because this can be changed so easily and that's what I really wanna focus in on today. You know, when you look at faith, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. So I'm adding to that by saying it, it actually reads, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I see that hearing, 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 the importance of hearing. Now, let me just really quick before going to the hearing aspect, let me show you the importance of the faith. When I was 20 years old, I had just been saved for a few months. I'll never forget this. I was sound asleep. And you know 20 year olds, when we sleep, we sleep deep. And four o'clock in the morning, and it was exactly four o'clock because my digital clock right beside the bed said 400. I found myself waking up and shouting out, I'm just looking for someone to believe. I heard these words coming out of my mouth. My body was covered in sweat. 
I turned on the light, I looked behind me, and my bed was, my outline of my body was, was wet from the sweat. And I, and I sat there and I paused and I thought, God just spoke to me. And then I thought this, and it was so stupid, I thought, God, couldn't it have been a little more profound if you wake me up and speak to me like that? But the next morning I got up and I kept hearing the words reverberate through my heart. I'm just looking for someone to believe. I'm just looking for someone to believe. And I remember I was walking across the parking lot of our apartment and I shouted out, oh my goodness, that is profound. When you think about it, who are the people that grieve Jesus more than anyone in the Gospels? Now, we're not talking about angered him. We're talking about grieved, okay? The Pharisees angered him more than anyone. But the people who grieved Jesus were the people who just didn't believe that he would do what he said he would do. I mean, he looks at his own disciples when he comes down the mountain. They can't cast the devil out of this, young, this man's son. And Jesus looks at him and says, oh, you faithless and perverted generation. How long do I have to put up with you? I mean, he was so grieved at their lack of faith. Constantly he was saying, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of no faith. Jesus certainly loved his disciples that he made these statements to over and over again. So he's not putting them down by saying of you a little faith. He's trying to say, guys, I want you to bring your faith level up to an, your faith up to another level and then to another level because you can't have anything from heaven unless you believe. And so it's of the utmost important that we understand that Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna amplify it, and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Now I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus talks to his disciples about. He has just told the parable of the sower. We have good ground, we have thorny ground, we have stony ground, we have the wayside. Four conditions of the heart. And if you look at the stony ground, he said it doesn't have much depth of earth. Now the earth is a type of the heart. So in other words, they immediately receive the word with joy, but afterwards when trouble comes for the word's sake, they fall away. Now, what we need is good ground. Ground that is rich and deep where the seeds of the word of God can grow. After he tells this parable, he then goes into this discourse with those that are close to him, his disciples and those that were really hungry. And that's you, because that's why you're watching this right now. You're hungry, you're pressing in. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, Pay close attention to what you hear. So now let's do a self-evaluation. Are we listening more to the media or to the word of God? You know, in the last week and a half, I don't think I've had a smile on my face more in the, in the last 10 years. Why? I am so filled with joy at the opportunities that we have right now as a church. And you'll understand more about this as I go further into the message. But pay close attention to what you hear. So do a self-examination. Am I listening a lot to social media, to blogs, to the news reports? Am I reading and filling myself with the word of God? Why does Jesus say pay close attention? He said the closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given. Now he's talking about his word right there. And you will receive even more. So he wants those that are close to him to receive. He wants you to be close to him. He said, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, but for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Crises, catastrophes will even remove what little we have, but to those who are deeply rooted in the word of God, crises actually end up strengthening us. And I'm gonna go more into this in a minute. Now, <clears throat> Immediately after these words, I don't think it's a coincidence and I've never seen this before until this week. He immediately says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who casts seed into the ground. Night and day while he is asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and it grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. The earth produces crops. Now in this case, the earth would be our heart. The heart produces the crops on its own. First the leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of the wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. Now, let's think about this. He's speaking to a bunch of people that don't have grocery stores. People had to grow their foods or trade to get somebody who directly did grow food. So let's think about living in this day when Jesus tells this parable. And let's just say, here's all my food, okay? 
That represents wheat kernels. It isn't, it's quinoa, but this is wheat kernels in our illustration. Everything's fine right now. I've got a ton of food in, in front of me, but let's say I eat all of this and now I have this. Okay, what do I do? I have to go out to the field, I have to plow it, I have to plant it, and I have to fertilize it and water it, and just as Jesus said, night and day. First comes a little blade that breaks through the ground, then comes the stalk, then comes the ear, then comes the fruit in the ear. Here's the problem. We right now are trying to build our faith and it takes time. The word has to be sown in our heart and over time it grows. And so God showed me this morning, and I love this, that this is actually a merciful thing for his people. You know, when Lisa woke up, she has not read this scripture in years and years and years, but she heard this scripture. Tell the godly, and I believe this is such a word for you, tell the godly that all will be well for them. But here's the situation. We're not in a catastrophe. We're in a serious situation. And what this serious situation is locating, where is our faith? Okay, now let's think about it. A lot of us don't like tests. Why don't we like tests? Because of midterms and finals. But what I've discovered is that tests actually locate what's in you. Think about a pilot. I just flew over the Pacific Ocean just last week. I am so glad the pilot passed the test. I wasn't in the ocean, the bottom of the ocean, because he had gone through a test and they had located in him that he had the ability to handle any crises. They put these pilots into a simulator and they do it frequently. And that simulator is only a test to locate where that pilot's ability is. This situation that's going right on right now is only locating where your faith is. Do an honest assessment. Do you have joy? Are you excited because there's opportunities for growing the kingdom right now? Or are you battling a lot of fear? That's only an indication of what's in your heart. Let me give you a, a situation that arose with me when I was young. I was in my early 20s. We were working for our church and a minister came through and gave me an opportunity to go and preach with an associate minister of his in Manila, the Philippines. It's actually a very large church. And I remember the, the minister said, hey, John, I'll pay half your ticket. You believe God for the other half. Well, the ticket was $2,000. And you have to understand, Lisa and I only had $100 to our name, maybe maybe 200 max. And I put the extra, that $1,000 on my credit card. And Lisa looked at me, and back in those days, when you bought an airline ticket, you didn't get penalized when you turn it back in. And Lisa said, John, make me one promise. And I said, what is it? She said, you will not get on that plane unless you, we have that $1,000. But she said, I'm not going into credit card debt for an airplane ticket. I want you to believe God. And I said, baby, you've got my word. And so I remember praying and praying and praying. Was my head screaming a little bit? But I kept praying. I had been putting the word of God in my heart. And I'll never forget I was one week before the flight was supposed to take off and I was at church and there was a man who was a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. He might have been close to a billionaire. He owned two jets. He attended our church and I knew him and I went up to him and I said, man, I want to tell you about my missions trip to the Philippines one week from today and I'm all excited, right? And I asked him, I said, could you take me to the airport next Monday morning? He said, sure, sure. I'd love to take you to the airport. I'm trying to help God get me that money and I'll never forget the whole week went by, nothing came in except for $25 from a guy in a grocery store. He said, I heard about your trip because my pastor announced it to the church. And let me, let me tell you, back in those days, you had to fight on your own. See, if one of our team members said, man, I've got an opportunity to go really minister, you know, we might, Lisa and I might jump in nowadays because we got more of mother and father's heart. But you see, I wonder if maybe I'm hindering people from growing in faith by doing that. So I'll never forget the night before. I am so just my head screaming, but yet my heart is at peace. And Lisa again said, John, don't get on that plane unless you've got the thousand dollars. I said, baby, I won't. I promise you I won't. Well, the next morning, the wealthy businessman doesn't show up at my apartment door. A Bible school student showed up. And I remember when I opened the door, he must have seen it, my faith. 
my face. My face went from a smile to, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? I didn't say those words, but I knew he could see it. And I said, oh, uh, so-and-so, the businessman was supposed to take me. He said, yeah, but last night he contacted me and said he had an emergency meeting that he got a, called away from. He said, but let me go back a few days. On Wednesday night at church, when pastor told everybody that you were going to the Philippines, God spoke to me and said, John doesn't have the money. I want you to pay for the ticket. He said, John, I'm a Bible school student. He said, I had the money, but it was like a lot of money for me. And he said, I stayed up till three o'clock in the morning wrestling with the Holy Spirit. And he said, finally, I said, Holy Spirit, if you make a way for me to give the money to John that's miraculous, I'll do it. He said, last night when that businessman asked me to take you to the airport, I about fell out of my bed. And he said, I want you to know you have the money. Get on the plane. And I'll never forget what that did for my faith. Here I was, 20, uh, 27 years old. I didn't realize that three years later, our pastor would launch us into Messenger International. And when we were launched, we had $300 to our name. And I didn't know where the next penny was coming from. God had told me not to call pastors. God had told me not to write letters. And even though my pastor gave me a letter of recommendation and 600 churches that, I could, that he had been to, big, big churches, and said, send my letter to them, God told me not to. He said, I know who you are. I don't want you out of my will. Trust me. And I will never forget, we left our church with $300 to our name. Our church gave us $1,500 extra to support us. But that was it. And I'll never forget going an entire month of not having a meeting anywhere. And we got to the point where we didn't even have the money for our house payment. And I'll, I prayed and I said, God, you have always provided for Lisa and I. If you don't provide for this time, then Lord, I'm gonna have to go get a job selling groceries, but I'm not gonna sell myself. Well, you know what happened? God miraculously, through a hippie couple in another state who didn't know our situation, provided that money. We saw God do this time and time and time again. So what happened is our faith began to be developed strong. Our, our crops had grown in our heart in the fact that God is our provider. Now let's fast forward to 2008. In 2008, when real estate went through the bottom and our whole economy went sour, for a ministry that doesn't have members, we had to trust God. But you know, it was so easy to trust God because God had, ever since that Bible school student took me to the airport, been developing my faith. The crops were growing. And I'll never forget what we did. We gave huge offerings. None of our employees had to take a pay cut. And we went through 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, and 12, without a hiccup. Let me tell you this, it will go well for the righteous. I just asking you, along with your pastors, to develop your faith. It is so important in this time where God's just saying, it's a test. Look at this coronavirus as a simulator. And you're finding out, oh wow, I'm fighting fear in all these areas. Now you've got time to get in the Word of God. Now, the second thing about faith is this. It has to be spoken. Okay? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, it says, We having the same spirit of faith, therefore we speak. Now listen to that. We having the same spirit of faith, therefore we speak. Jesus makes this statement. Not a preacher. These are the words of Jesus. He said... Whoever says, now listen to how many times he says, says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart. So there's the heart, there's the ground that we talked about. But he believes those things he says, there's the second time, will be done. He will have whatever he says. So Jesus uses the word says three times more than the importance of putting the seed of the word of God in your heart. Why is that? Because the Bible says forever, O Lord, your word is established in heaven. It does not say it's established in heaven and earth. How do we establish his word in the earth? God makes the statement in Isaiah 55, 11 that is so curious. He said, so shall the word be that goes forth from my mouth. He said, it will not return to me void. Why would he talk about the word returning to him? Because he said, the word of God going forth is like rain coming down on the earth. Now listen to this, this is so good. How does that return, the word of God return to him? 
when we say it. You see, Jesus never asked God to calm the storm. He never asked God to heal an ear. He never asked God to heal an eye. He spoke to the eye. He spoke to the ear. He spoke to the wind and the waves. Why? Because man has been given authority on the earth by God. God says, I need a man or a woman on earth to speak my word to establish it. And so, whatever you're facing, if you're facing symptoms in your body, begin to speak to your body. You would say it like this, body, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the word of God tells me to glorify God in my spirit, which is God's. And Psalm 91 tells me that he protects me from the deadly disease that stalks in darkness. The word of God tells me that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed and made whole. You begin to speak and establish his promises in your body. If your employer has put you on a furlough, if you are now unemployed, you've been let go, you start speaking, saying food, provision, whatever is needed. I call you in the name of Jesus into this home. I trust you you, God, to provide for me. And so when you begin to speak the word of God, now watch what begins to happen. I'll never forget, I was in Hawaii ministering and a pastor and his wife stopped me in the aisle as I was walking down the aisle on a Friday night after the conference. And the wife pulled out x-rays and she said, this is the x-rays of a normal eye. And I'm thinking, where's she going with this? Then she pulled out x-rays of an eye that had a bunch of black behind the eye. And I said, what is that? She said, that's the x-rays of my son's eye last month. He has a very rare disease that was causing him to go blind permanently and rapidly. There is no cure for this disease. She said, our church was fasting, praying, crying out to God to heal my son. But she said, my husband started reading your book, Relentless, every morning in his devotions. He came bursting out of his study one one morning last month while he was reading the book and said, we're doing this all wrong. We need to speak to our son's eye in the name of Jesus because God has already given us healing. It's in his word. We just have to speak to his eye. The apostles never asked God to heal the cripple. Go look at it all through the, God, uh, through the book of Acts. They spoke to the legs in the name of Jesus. So they began to speak to their son's eye in the name of Jesus. And that very day in January, They had gone to the doctor. They got the set of x-rays. That was the normal protocol at the lab. They went over to the professional offices. The doctor came in, said they messed up, sent them back to the lab. They got a second set of x-rays. The doctor walked in, said they messed up again. So he said, I'm going with you this time. They went over again and listen to this. The doctor watched him do the x-rays. He came back and the doctor's face was white and he said, your son has no more disease. I don't know how this has happened. It was incurable. I have no explanation. You know, two years later, I saw that couple and they then gave me the x-rays of that young man. They said he's still healed, he's 14 years old. They spoke to his eyes in the name of Jesus. Some of you need to speak to your finances, you need to speak to your physical condition, you need to speak for jobs to open up for you. Listen, if you were let go, you're in the middle of a promotion. You're not being demoted, you're being promoted because you belong to God and all shall go well with the righteous. Remember Isaiah 310, the word that God gave Lisa just this morning, and I really believe it was for you. And then finally, we need to act on the word of God. You don't act proving to God you believe, you act because you believe. So if you feel like the actions aren't there, if you're seeing, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really moving more out of fear than faith, then what do we have to do? We have to start planting that seed in the ground. We have to get into the Word of God and make sure we're spending more time in the Word. That's when you want to build your faith. Now, I want to encourage you. This is so important. You know, when this whole thing just began to happen last week, Lisa and I sowed the biggest seed for Messenger International than we have done all year. We gave a huge offering to a ministry. I want to say this. This is not the time to back off from your tithes. You need to continue to tithe to your local church. You need to make sure that you're putting the house of God first. Lisa and I did this in 2008, and this is what brought us through. We gave away huge offerings from our ministry and from us personally. We're doing the same thing now because let me tell you, now is not the time to withhold your giving. So make sure you send in your tithes. Ask your pastors, how do I get my tithe into the church since we can't meet right now? That is so important. The other thing we want to do is we want to give. 
And so at Messenger International, what we're doing is we're making our entire library available to you for free over the next 30 days. We have years and years of experience in studying the Word of God on about 26 courses. They're all located in a place called All Access. And what we want to do is completely give that to every member of the church. And you just go to messengercourses.com, sign up, and you get everything on there for free. We've got courses specifically for moms, for for business people, for relationships, for marriage. We've even got courses for kids. I think there's over 40 programs for kids. And my own son's children, my grandchildren, have been greatly strengthened through those programs. And so you just sign up. And then when you're done, after 30 days, if you go, you know what? I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Just unsubscribe. You haven't paid a thing. And we have given this to you because We believe it is time to build your faith. As you know, Lisa and I, we are very strong in the Word, and all those courses are laced with the Word of God. They're just put in a systematic way to build your faith. We've also got guest teachers like Chip Judd, who is absolutely one of the best marriage counselors in the nation. He does a whole course on relationships. We've got Driven by Attorney. We've got Honor. We've got the one that I'm actually doing tomorrow that will come out in a couple weeks on breaking intimidation. Our team really felt like right now, this coronavirus is an intimidating spirit. Well, you'll be able to go through that brand new course for free over the next 30 days. So I want you to make sure you take advantage of that. And now what I wanna do is I wanna pray for every one of you. If you're fighting symptoms of sickness right now, don't let fear grip your heart. Believe in God, believe in Jesus. And Father, I just want you right now, just on your computer screen, wherever you're at, your television screen, just put your hand forward and I'm gonna put my hand forward and we're gonna join together and we're gonna agree. And so Father, I speak to sickness and disease that has come against my brother and my sister. And I command you now to depart from the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't own this body. This body belongs to God and we are commanded to glorify God in this body and in our heart which belongs to God. And so in Jesus' name, I release healing into that physical body of yours right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I speak peace to those that are troubled. To those that are suffering in their marriage, I break the power of the spirit of division and strife, and I speak peace into this marriage. Father, I speak provision into this household in the name of Jesus. Lord, it doesn't matter where. Your covenant states to us, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, Your covenant says, I've never seen the righteous nor forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. I call for supernatural divine provision. I call for inspired ideas to come to my brothers and my sisters even right now. In Jesus' name, I pray a hedge of protection. I pray Psalm 91, you dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You abide under the shadow of the Almighty and His promises are your armor and your protection. He will deliver you from the disease that stalks in darkness. He has set you free from every snare, every trap the enemy tries to throw against you. It will be well for the righteous. It will be well for my brother and sister in Jesus' mighty name. Some of you watching right now, you may not have a relationship with your creator. I want to give you an opportunity to enter into a relationship, to experience the peace that passes all understanding. Let me make this really clear. You don't get a relationship with God by going to church. You don't get a relationship with God by being a good person. Because the Bible says every one of us have fallen short of his standard. He can't, if we were to come into his presence, apart from Jesus, we would be annihilated. Not because he hates us, he loves us. It's because his light is so glorious. He is so glorious. The children of Israel ran away when he appeared. But God sent Jesus. And Jesus, often in the Bible, is called the groom, and we are called the bride. The way to enter into a relationship with God is what a bride does when she gets married to a groom. Now, when that bride, when that girl walks down the aisle with that white dress on, she's saying something to the whole world. You know what she's saying? She's saying goodbye to 3.7 billion guys. She's saying, this is the one and only man I'm giving my entire heart and life to. You know, Lisa did that 38 years ago this October 2nd. And I'm going to tell you, she's made mistakes. Now, I've made many more mistakes. We're talking about a bride, not a groom right now. She's made a lot of mistakes, but one thing that's never changed, she gave me her entire heart, her entire heart, 38 years ago this October 2nd, and that's never changed. 
And when you, the only way you can enter into a relationship is to profess Jesus as your Lord, giving him your entire heart and life and trusting your life to him. And let me tell you, he loves you so much. He died for you before you ever even knew him. How much more now when you enter into a bridegroom relationship with him, will he not take care of you? The world doesn't have answers. I'm sorry to say the world's in trouble. The world's gonna face, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just tell you this right now, I'm not meaning to scare you. This is serious, but catastrophes are coming. And over the next 10 years, we're gonna see some things that is gonna put a lot of fear into people, except for the people of God who believe, who have the word of God in their hearts. If he died for you, how much more will he take care of you through every serious situation and every single crisis, every single catastrophe? You have nothing to fear. If you want that relationship, then the Bible says you need to turn away from all your lovers. What are your lovers? Those are the things that offend him. Those are the things that actually drove the nails in his hands. Turn away from them in your heart and give yourself completely to him. You may make a mistake. Lisa's made many mistakes. I've made many more again, I will say it. But let me tell you, her heart has been steadfast, loyal to me ever since the day we said I do. And so I wanna say this. I wanna pray with you right now to do that. Say this out loud with me. God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Forgive me for living life my way, apart from you, my creator. But today, that's changing. On this very day, I give my spirit, my soul, and my body, everything I am and everything I have to you. You are now my bridegroom and I'm your bride. You are my Lord and I am yours forever and ever. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. Thank you for cleansing me and giving me a brand new nature, a nature that can now stand in your presence. I'm so grateful in Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision, Jesus said, confess, tell somebody. And I wanna encourage you. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. When these restrictions are lifted, get back to your church. Attend your church every Sunday and let your pastor, with the gift that he has on his life, let your pastors sow the word of God into your heart, but you also, every morning, spend time in God's word. I love you so very much, and let me say again, messengercourses.com, we want to continue to sow alongside with your pastor, both of us building up your faith in this time where the world and people who don't know Jesus need you. God bless you.